Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from an organization for, uh, that's called uh, the Leadership Institute. Uh, and our purpose is to basically train folks who are philosophically conservative to be effective in the public policy process. We have uh, about 34 different training schools that, r that run the gamut. Uh, I've distributed some flyers, uh, uh, one particular flyer that I thought would be pretty useful to you folks. It's about our grassroots campaign school, uh, grassroots activist school. I just wanted to point that out. Um, a lot of you folks are fighting battles on the local level. We, we've worked with a number of folks, uh, specifically on <coughs> statewide voter initiatives. Um, a lot of our graduates are elected. Lo local, local government officials who've, who've won elections uh, to city commissions or the state legislature, and um, we have also graduates in Congress and what have you. So at any rate, without further ado, um, we'll just jump right in here. Uh, I had a friend recently who uh, went to buy a car, and uh, this friend of mine had all, he, he had a, his idea of what he wanted in this car. He had this dream car idea, of, uh, and, and uh, what he basically was looking for after, after, after uh, giving it some thought was, uh, was the brand new Ford, Ford Mustang, 2005 Ford Mustang. That car to him had everything he wanted. Uh, he he uh, wanted a sporty car. He wanted a convertible. So he went down to the local dealership and found the exact car that he wanted, a black convertible Ford Mustang, which had in it everything, all the ideas that he wanted. It had all the bells and whistles, the leather interior, the whole nine yards. Well, he was so excited when he was so excited when he uh, found this car uh, because it was even for the price that he wanted. It was within his it was within his price range. He he couldn't contain himself. He didn't even take it for a test drive. So he runs out. Uh, he runs runs over to to sign on the dotted line to purchase the car. Goes takes the keys, gets into the car. Car he just takes a whiff of the interior. Has he just he loves the new car smell? It's got, again, has everything that he was looking for in the car. He goes, puts the car, the key in the ignition, gives it a good crank, nothing happens. So he, undaunted, he tries this again, puts his foot back on the clutch and cranks it again, and yet again nothing happens. Well, he decides to jump out. He, he's now gotten frustrated. This brand new car of his, his perfect dream car. He, he pops the hood gets out, looks in front, uh, looks under the hood, sees that there's, there's no engine under the hood. Well, the, the car, he thought, had all, the th all of the ideas and the dreams and everything that he wanted in the car, but without an engine, the car was useless. Well, a grassroots organization, uh, uh, your, I your ideas, uh, well, however great and, and, and correct they may be, are just that, they're just ideas unless, unless there's an engine to, to, to make them happen, unless there's some way that you can to, to move these, these ideas into a reality. And I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can do that through a vector uh, of, of grassroots organizing. This brings us to a, a popular theory in politics that you've probably heard. It's, it's a, or you've heard some theory that's related to this, if you haven't heard it exactly, but it's the Sir Galahad theory. I will win because my heart is pure. Another way of saying it is I'm gonna win because I'm right. I've, you know, I'm correct on the issues. I, I can you know, reason it out and show people that, that where I stand is the, actually the, the correct issue, uh, is, the, is, the, is the correct stance. Um, we all know people that, that hold this, this idea. Um, maybe, maybe we don't think that this idea, as naively stated as, as this, is, is prevalent, but it is prevalent nonetheless in other forms. Obviously, this theory is simply wrong. Um, we are not going to win because we're correct on an issue. Uh, at the Leadership Institute, we have one basic principle, and it's being right in the sense of being philosophically correct is insufficient. It is not in and of itself sufficient to win. Victory in any public policy battle is determined by the number and the effectiveness of the activists on either side. Political technology, therefore, determines political success. It 
to, well, ultimately I'm getting ahead of myself, political technology determines the number of activists that you have, and it is that political technology which determines political success. Political technology, what I mean by that is those tools by which we use to organize people, like-minded folks, <laughs> to get out and defeat these sorts of loony ideas. So, what, how are we going to do this? How are we going to uh, uh, influence public policy? essentially using, by using political technology. You first have to, what I'm going to suggest, and because it's part of this grassroots uh, talk, is what, the idea is you must, you must build a grassroots coalition uh, through an army of volunteers with an ultimate goal of influencing the, po the, the process. Of like, you're, you're going to be organizing like-minded people um, and, and move the fulcrum in such a way so as to influence the public policy process. The first principle here is elected officials are a lot like donkeys, okay? Um, with high profile, with high profile issues uh, in the public policy process, you're not going to be able to convince, you're not going to be able to convince a legislator, legislator to change his stance. Uh, at, you know, you might as well talk to a wall. Um, the only thing that these these folks react to is two forms of stimulus, just like a donkey. It's sticks and it's carrots. And you have to be able to wield both if you're going to have influence. So first, and, the, and possibly, uh, the, uh, well, both are equally important. The, the first thing I'll talk about is the stick. Of course, this, this, the biggest stick is the immediate threat of them losing their job at the ballot box. Okay? This isn't the only stick, um, but all, this, all the other sticks are relate to ultimately this, this idea of them losing their job. Okay? Uh, it's, I got up there skinning the coyote. Well, you know, a farmer doesn't have to kill all the coyotes to protect his sheep. He doesn't have to do that. All he has to do is find one coyote, kill it, skin it, and hang it on a post, and it'll, and it'll do the job of, of scaring the rest of the coyotes and protect his sheep. So you don't have to, I was talking uh, uh, just beforehand um, uh, with someone, and uh, the idea is you don't also have to be, you don't have to be an 800 pound gorilla to have people bring you nice yellow bananas. You have to have pe let, make people think you're an 800 pound gorilla. The biggest carrot is the promise that you will rally your coalition to support that elected official in future battles, specifically future elections. Uh, too often grassroots organizations, too often they focus on punishing the bad guys and then they assume that when they do the right thing, oftentimes they won't do anything to, to help that guy because you know they did the right thing, they should have done that. You have, to, you have to give support to the, to the good people that, that do the right thing so that they're not, uh, so they're not changed to the dark side. Um, some, quick, some quick tips here. First off, this, is, it's, this isn't the venue to be able to talk about how you're going to be able to um, exert pressure through an election, exactly winning an election at the local level, uh, GOTV efforts, um, uh, and all that. So I'm going to focus on, I think, to be the most important element is, which is uh, generating a volunteer base, uh, building a coalition through volunteers is what I'm going to basically talk about. But the biggest key, and it will seem very obvious after you hear it, but the biggest key uh, to getting people to volunteer is simply, is simply to ask. Uh, the RNC did one of these studies. It's kind of like uh, a study that, that determines that the sun rises in east and, and sets in the west. But um, one of the study that basically showed that the number one reason individuals get involved in a campaign or cause was simply because somebody asked them to get involved. All politics, all politics is local. If you haven't heard that, this is a line by Tip, from Tip O'Neill. And, and, and let me tell you a story, a, little, a quick story about Tip O'Neill to, to prove this point, if you haven't heard this. You know, Tip O'Neill was the former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, a, a, a longtime elected official. He was running in one of his first races, and uh, it was the morning of election day, and he goes walking out to his car, and his little old lady neighbor uh, saw him walking out, and she was, she was in the garden. She says, hey, Tip, I just want you to know, I'm going to vote for you, even though you didn't ask me. And, and, he, and, and Tip says, Mrs. Jones, you know, what do you mean? I, I didn't think I had to ask you. I, we've known each other for so long. And she says, Tip, everybody likes to be asked. And, and it's from that point forward that <laughs> Tip realized 
and uh, 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 sort of circulating the idea ultimately that that politics as is a, is, is a local phenomenon, and the biggest part of it is asking people to get involved. Now, the idea is how are you going to do this? Building a mem how are we going to build a membership list to this grassroots organization? Just a few tips here. Yeah, you're, uh, obviously your organization has to stand for something. If you're chasing every uh, uh, if you're chasing every barking dog or running the kick every barking dog, you're not going to be able to be very effective. I mean. Uh, if you're running around one week talking about social security reform and the next week asbestos, uh, you're not, it doesn't really galvanize your, 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 your supporters. Now, other than the ob uh, some other obvious stuff is, you get, is you're going to begin by networking. Um, you got to dig your well before you're thirsty. Uh, some quick, it's not lining up exactly right, but that's okay. Um, a network is an organized collection of your personal contacts and your personal contacts own networks. Networking is finding, is finding fast whom you need to get, what you need in any given situation, and helping others do the same. Okay. <coughs> Networking, uh, it, it, this is the most rudimentary element of building, an, of, 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 of beginning the, this is the embryonic stages of beginning a, a coalition of people, attending uh, rotary meetings, key, uh, uh, Kiwanis Club meetings, Elks Club meetings, uh, local party meetings, uh, church meetings, whatever they be, may be, so where you're meet, running into lots of people and, and being able to, to build relationships and you find out who, who agrees with you on certain things and who can help you and how you can help them. And there's the top-down approach, of course, and you, you, approach, you approach leaders, party leaders. Uh, a, big, a big element of people that are always forgotten is former candidates. Former candidates have already done this, um, especially ones that have Hopefully, people, uh, some of the best people to contact are former candidates who've lost uh, because they're not using their coalition or their volunteer list much anymore. So uh, these, the, the campaign managers of these folks, uh, like I said, civics club leaders and, and uh, heads of church groups and any other, uh, any other uh, such organization. Also, uh, uh, not to be overlooked is student organizations uh, through colleges. This is. Uh, it's one of the, e the easiest demographic to mobilize for any issue is is um, is college students. Frankly, uh, I spent most I've spent most of my time organizing at the college level, and it's it's a it's a demographic that has a the time, uh, b they're idealistic, and um, and a lot easier to motivate than than you know your average uh, working professional. Um, bottom up uh, tabling. This is my personal favorite. Setting up a, simply setting up a membership table uh, at, high, at high, foot, high foot traffic events, county fairs, conventions. I have some other things that will probably spill onto the next slide, I guess. Um, uh, setting up, like I said, at county fairs, conventions, um, colleges, uh, universities, and <laughs> in, in the high foot traffic areas. Also, um, uh, high schools, contacting area, high school civics. Uh, and government teachers. Uh, some of my best volunteers for uh, for a campaign that I worked on was uh, was the entire junior class of a local public high school. Uh, it was a charter high school, so they were more uh, free market oriented from the get go. But uh, um, uh, those were some of my best volunteers to get out and, and knock doors and uh, and and do things of this nature. And also, the great thing about high school students is they're almost all looking for. Uh, volunteer hours, uh, service hours, uh, resume material, letters of recommendation, and the like. So, on tabling, um, oh, here we, it spilled over. Okay, let's see. Um, the the last note I'll say on that is what tabling is and what it, it isn't. What tabling is not is, is not where you set up a table and you sit behind it and you hope people come to you. It has to be active soliciting. Again, the whole key is asking people. You're not you're not going to they're not going to join unless you ask them. It's in front of the table. And it's actively going up to people and asking them to get involved, asking them to sign up, and have, a, have the concept of what you're organizing for down to an elevator pitch, 10, uh, maybe 10 seconds, of, uh, so that you can pitch them on it and get them signed up so that you can activate them at a later time. Um, and how do you motivate and activate people? I, I'll suggest this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The only way to get someone to do something is to make them want to do it themselves. The idea is, is 
to quite each, each person's self-interest. And, and by doing that, you'll be able to get people to do a lot more because they're doing it ultimately for themselves. So what is that? What, is, what are some of these things? Well, um, I'll get back to that point on the book in a second. Simple, easy things, knowing, knowing people's names. Somebody comes and volunteers a couple times um, and you don't know their names, it's unacceptable. You have to really, if the two biggest things that people like to hear, uh, the two biggest phrases people like to hear are their name and the phrase thank you. Those are the two biggest things people like to hear. And so both of these are, are you incorporate into to the way you treat volunteers and the way you treat people that you organize. Uh, again, knowing their motivations. Uh, let folks volunteer for their own reasons. Uh, retirees like, perhaps like to keep busy. Students needing volunteer hours. Whatever the reason it is. Um, I'm going to go on a little sidebar on this. This also has to do with um, people who would, might, might vote to support your, your, your candidate or cause. A lot of times people will vote, um, they'll, they'll vote or volunteer for, for their own reason if we're talking about organizing for a candidate. If you want a good market-oriented, market property rights-oriented um, uh, uh, elected official, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the reason why somebody else votes for this guy. Okay, um, uh, you want them to vote for him for whatever reason it is. Now, I'm going to bring up um, not to. I'm only bringing this up as an example. For example. A lot of uh, uh, grassroots groups make this mistake. For example, I know of uh, pro-life organizations that will organize, and they'll go through an area and they'll try to organize for a particular candidate, and then they'll um, they'll go around and let everybody know this candidate's pro-life. Well, that's that's really stupid for a number of reasons. One one of which is that most people don't care about that issue. Uh, well, how about this? Most people are div divided on this issue, and and you're trying to get people to vote for, ultimately you're just trying to get them to vote for their candidate. You want to know what's important to them and communicate to them on that issue. For, perhaps they would have voted for your guy if uh, they knew his stance on tax policy or education or gun control or whatever it is. Um, so you ultimately are communicating people t based on what they, based on, on uh, their own reasons, their own motivations. And volunteers are similar if you're organizing for a candidate. And that's a big part of building a coalition. I was at a I was at a a candidate's uh, uh, grassroots fundraiser slash uh, volunteer event, and it was the funniest thing. You had these these uh, really hardcore conservative uh, uh, homeschoolers, and then you had um, these. Th that was one part of this coalition. Then you had these these bikers, hell's angels, that were at this event uh, because they were against this guy was against helmet laws. So you had these two different groups of people that were showing up and they'd never ever hang out otherwise, but they're able to support their guy for the reason of their own choice. That's, that's ultimately the way you, you've got to, uh, that's a big thing that you have to keep in mind. Um, simple rule, follow up, don't check up. It's a nuanced difference, but when you're talking with people, you, it's, you're not calling them back and, and, or, or lording over them in such a way as to say like, uh, um, look, how's that coming along? Let's, uh, let's make this happen. The nuanced difference that's checking up, the following up might be, hey, how, how are you doing? Is there, uh, how are you doing on that project? Is there anything I can do to help? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a nuanced difference, but it's an important difference because if they feel like uh, you're, uh, you're simply checking up on them because of their incompetence, uh, that's a, that, the, the, other, the other related topic on this is that volunteers aren't your employees. Um, they're giving their time. And so uh, a lot of times people will, and inadvertently start treating volunteers uh, in such a way as, as to turn them off because uh, you're telling them exactly what to do all the time and, and you're checking up on them all the time and it gets kind of annoying. So um, simple ways to motivate. Have, you know, this is going to be talking about a few different things. Uh, Volunteer of the Week is, an, is, if you read the book, I would heavily recommend uh, Paul Begala and, and James Carville's uh, Buck Up, Suck Up, and Come Back When You Foul Up. It's a neat book. On, uh, there's, there's some suggestions on motivating people. Carville, who I personally can't stand, um, but has some great points in this book. And um, uh, one of the things he, he did to, to motivate staffers was simply give them a, giving them a gold star. 
and letting him know, a really literally a sticker to a grown man. And uh, he said that you, you, you wouldn't believe the, the, the reaction that he got from people when in front of the other volunteers, he said, hey, you get a gold star for what you, you've done and, and uh, let everybody else know what they've, what they've done. People like, again, to, to hear their name and hear the phrase thank you in some way, shape, or form. It's a powerful motivating factor. Um, some ways of, that you can treat them if, you've, if you are running a, a campaign or a cause, having them meet with the, 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 the important people in that effort, uh, having them, uh, you know, uh, having Randall come in and having them come to go, go to lunch with Randall, for example, uh, and talk policy. Um, publicly thank them. Uh, that's the whole thing that I've been saying right there. Uh, in your correspondence, in your um, emails and, and different things like that, especially your emails to all your activists, you can simply, uh, right in the beginning of your email, say, I just want to thank Bob, Jane, and so-and-so for, for their outstanding work this past week. Uh, so that everyone realizes what they've done. Letters, uh, letters of recommendation, this is for people in that demographic that might, would, might want them, high school, college students. Um, always provide refreshments. If you're running an event uh, and you're trying to get a lot of people to go out and, and walk doors, again, this isn't part of this lecture in terms of, of, of what you're going to do in terms of door-to-door, -door phone banking, and different uh, organized and professionalized GOTV efforts, but um, treating them well uh, through you know, not making them, you know, they work for a couple hours, they get thirsty, they got to leave, they got to eat, things like that. You can, you can get kids. I've had, I've had high school and college kids come and volunteer an entire Saturday, six or, uh, between six and eight hours, because um, uh, they didn't have to go to, to get food. They, we had pizza, we had, we had drinks and what have you. So, um, also college kids love free food. Um, it does, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do for you, um, they'll do, uh, uh, dozens of hours of work, uh, which if you know, they're getting paid the minimum wage, they'd, they'd have hundreds of dollars just from the minimum wage. I'm doing the, the level of work that they're doing, but you give them a few slices of pizza and that they'll do even more. Um, it's great. Uh, obviously, always recruit more than you need. When you're building a volunteer list, you're, you're, you're using your, you're, you're in that beginning phase or tabling the top down, all these different approaches. You're, you're always going to have, you want more, way more names than you need. Okay, because when you call, you're, you're going to, um, because when the time comes, ultimately, you're going to have to call through your list. Um, when a person, this is one of my pet peeves with organizations that get volunteers. They'll take down the name, phone number, email address of the person, say, oh, this is great. And the guy's like, hey, I vol the person goes home. They're like, hey, I volunteered with this organization. No one calls them. How many times does this happen? Nobody calls. Nobody contacts them. And and for some reason, there's this phobia about actually calling people and asking them to show up and do something. That's why they put their names on the, on the f flyer in the first place. So routinely calling through your list uh, is one of the, especially in campaign season, if you're, if you're organizing for a campaign. Um, um, I I've, uh, I've tell people to call the 10 weeks before the election. I call through my list. I'll build a list of five, six, seven hundred thousand 700,000 people and call through the list every week asking people to come and come to an event, knowing that I'm only going to get maybe less than 10% of them to show up, but it'd be a different 10% every time because the same 100 people, same 50 people aren't going to show up every week. So routinely giving them opportunities to come out and asking them to do things is, is, is an essential part to getting people organized and activated. Um, keep them busy. Don't waste their time. People show up. A lot of times this is, you know, this is more connected with campaign work, but you know, a person shows up uh, for a, uh, for, goes to a campaign headquarters, shows up to, to volunteer their time, and the guy who's in charge of the office kind of looks at them and is like, well, I, you know, let's see what I can do, and kind of starts, you know, realizing there's nothing for them to do, and goes back, you know, there's, maybe you can come back some other time. Oh, yeah, that person's going to come back. He just, vol he just took, you know, whatever time out of his day and planned in that he's going to probably work there for a few hours, but you didn't, have, you didn't have anything for them to do. I'm sure they're going to do that a number of other times. No, they won't. That's the, the, the number one way you can lose volunteers is by not keeping them busy. And uh, another, another related issue is, is, um, is you reward responsibility with more responsibility. Your best volunteers, you, you give more work. Um, uh, th and in fact, some of the best volunteers, you might think, oh, this guy doesn't actually, he, he, this student or this, uh, uh, this 
person doesn't have a lot to do. Maybe they're they're single. Maybe they're um, uh, they don't have a uh, a family uh, that's keeping them busy. Whatever the reason you might think, this person has plenty of time on their hands. Sometimes the 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 the, the worst people to organize are the people that have plenty of time on their hands, uh, especially with college students. Um, you you want to find people that are the most busy because it's the busiest people that will. Um, uh, it's the busiest people that uh, uh, will find time to, to actually do what you want them to do. It's kind of a counterintuitive <laughs> principle, but it, it's definitely true. Um, you never fire a volunteer. You only reassign them. Uh, volunteers, uh, you, can, you find people you're canvassing or wh whatever you're, it is that project that you're doing. They might be entirely uh, inept at what it is that you're trying to get them to do. Reassign them to something else. Uh, you don't fire a volunteer. Maybe you, uh, you appoint someone, uh, uh, for example, you might appoint someone as, the, as, the, uh, as, the, as your block chairman or your, uh, the, the chairman of this particular area of your county or something of that nature. And you realize that this person's a total disaster. Well, instead of, instead of firing them, what you do is you just say, well, you know what we're going to do? I, since you're so busy, since there's so much being done, I think there needs to be someone, a, a co-chair to your position. And all of a sudden, that then, then there's somebody. The, the issue, the, the big thing is, you don't want to turn off a, a potential volunteer who might, uh, uh, it, by firing them uh, from a volunteer position, and then and then uh, possibly poisoning the well with your other volunteers because you don't know who that volunteer is friends with, and all of a sudden you might lose ten other volunteers because they're so offended that they're not there and they volunteered ultimately to hang out with their friends or whatever the reason is. It's. Uh, um, just a basic principle. So, um, never send. Obviously, we include this in the lecture for kind of obvious reasons. Um, never send them to do anything illegal or 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 uh, you know, tearing down yard signs or or you know a yard sign is never won in election, folks. And I, I love I love it when people go running around tearing up yard signs as if I don't, I've never known a yard sign to actually drive someone to a pole or knock on a door or call someone. So I don't know why people do do things like that and. And then, and then you catch somebody who's high up in the campaign who's done it, and then their campaign's over. Because that yard sign would have made the difference. Um, uh, this, is, you know, th this is kind of obvious as well. Um, you know, never give your underage volunteers alcohol. Um, but that's it. Um, this is, again, just kind of a basic overview of what can be done and what I can kind of explain in 20 minutes. So I hope this is of some use.